topics, but you feel important. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you so much to the Institute of European Democracy. And thank you to Erspan and Jija and the Hungarian European Society. I am going to open up with maybe 15 minutes, a 10, 15 minutes of comments, and then I'd like to open it up to discussion. Um, this is obviously an enormous subject. And I, what I want to do is just lay down a few markers especially in thinking about the sources of political change in the region. And this is something that I have been studying since, uh, essentially since 1989. I was a student when the wall fell, actually in Paris. I was at Sciences Po at the time. And immediately I became fascinated with the question of what explains the variation among trajectories of political change in these emerging post-communist democracies in the region. And it didn't take long until I realized that unlike most studies of comparative political change which focus on domestic factors, in this region we also had a very important role of external actors, especially the accession process to the European Union. Um, and so here we have, I think, now the challenge of trying to understand again the interplay of domestic and external factors in political change. The first point I want to make is about the narrative of democratic progress. And this is really kind of a human point, right? We, I think for many of us, since 1989, even though we saw all the problems and we saw the fact that many countries transitioning from communism were simply transitioning to another form of authoritarianism, and this was the case across much of the post-Soviet region, in our region, and also eventually in southeastern Europe, we felt a sense of democratic pro progress. And this was mirrored in the narrative of essentially European political change since World War II, and in American political change since World War II, right? A narrative of democratic progress where greater democratic quality means, it means human rights, it means equality, it means tolerance, inclusion, fairness. And the idea that once you include, for example, more minorities and women and people of different religions and ethnicities into public life, you are improving the quality of, of democracy and the quality of public life. So now across the board we're experiencing, I think, what was for many of us a very unexpected and unfortunate pushback against the sense of democratic progress. And here, can you hear me in the back? I'm not sure. <laughs> and here in the region, unfortunately the Visegrad countries have become a kind of poster child for the, the end of this narrative of democratic progress along with my other adopted country, the United States. So, what does this mean for the region? Um, well, I just want to say I'm nostalgic for the time when the European Union was enlarging, and many of my colleagues were very slow to even realize that the EU would enlarge. And when they realized these countries they knew nothing about um, were coming in, they were very concerned, and I was always assuring them it's not going to be our countries here in this region that cause problems for European integration. And I was right for you know, a good two decades, uh, and now this has changed. So where do we look for the, for the cause of this change? So I'm going to focus on one thing, which doesn't mean that other things are not equally important. I'm going to focus on political parties. So in my work, I consider political parties to be the real drivers of political change. And this is something which is important for students and civil society actors, and scholars to realize that at the end of the day, if you want to change politics, it's political parties that get elected, that govern, that change policy, right? And what we show, we have a big research project in Chapel Hill called the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, and in that project we're able to map the positions of political parties. And what we saw for the first 20 years, roughly, or 15 years after uh, 89 is that essentially political change in this region was away from what we called the post-communist magnet. And I have lots of pictures and maybe I'll distribute them uh, if you're interested, where essentially parties were becoming less left-wing economically on the economic left-right spectrum. 
But more importantly, they were moving away from traditional authoritarian and nationalist positions towards more green, alternative, and liberal positions. So if you look at it on a graph, they're moving towards the center on the economy, and they're moving away from these traditional authoritarian and nationalist positions. And this was hand in hand with joining the European Union, with the process of qualifying for membership. And at one point, we actually have, in almost all the candidate countries, an almost complete consensus about the benefits, about joining the EU. And in order to get to that point, we have major parties fundamentally changing their positions to become more EU compatible. And this means respect for minority rights, toning down ethnic nationalism as a source of political, um, a way to get votes at election time. And I'm writing a book about this, but some of the most dramatic ones have been in the most unexpected places, right? Like in Serbia, Vucic, I don't need to explain to this audience, or in Croatia, uh, the Hadesa. But now what we're seeing is instead of building consensus, although in Serbia it was still pretty impressive, right? For a while we had a parliament without a single anti-EU party. This was good. Um, <laughs> and considering that Serbia is in the negotiation process. But now what we're seeing instead is polarization. And this polarization has been two things. And here, Hungary has led the way. So in our data, Hungary looked like this before any of the other countries. Virtually no competition on the economic left-right. So party, our party experts essentially put most of the parties in the center. Orban is a bit to the left of the left-wing parties. That's always been a fun fact about Hungary. And then all the competition is on what we call this tangal or social axis. All of the competition is about identity issues. So Hungary came first, but now we see Croatia very polarized on identity issues, virtually no competition on the economy, except for our friends who are very left, but they're not quite in the game here. Um, you see this now increasingly in Poland, in the Czech Republic, and Slovakia where all the competition at election time is on these issues. And when I say identity issues, I'm sanitizing this, right? What I really mean is that the, the right wing, or the, you know, not right wing economically, but the traditional authoritarian nationalist appeals are against refugees, against minorities, against the other, and increasingly also against women. Um, so this is a real concern, not only that we have such strong parties that are being elected on these traditional authoritarian and nationalist platforms, but also that political competition has now been reduced to these issues, and that competition where we traditionally had on the economic left-right about the role of the state in the economy, about funding for education and health care, and how the state should best improve the lives of citizens, has been pushed aside. Now, one of my problems with this debate is that we tend to talk in the passive voice, right? I just said it has been pushed aside, but there are actually specific actors who are pushing this aside, and those are the leaders of the political parties that are benefiting from this polarization. So, we have a lot of names for them. I, one of my colleagues calls them dirt, damn illiberal rent-seeking thugs. <laughs> I don't know if that should be in the academic literature. <laughs> um, but it's clear that these incumbent ruling elites have one goal, and that is to concentrate power. And they have a remarkably common playbook when it comes to concentrating power. For a long time, I really pushed back against this thesis that the rest of the region is going the way of Orban, right? This is what people said to me all the time. Oh, is the rest of East Central Europe going to end up like Orban's Hungary? Is, are they going to copy him? And I said, no, lots of variation. And there is a lot of variation in terms of the strength of the opposition, how well organized are other political parties, what is civil society like? There is huge variation. These countries are not all going to end up like uh, Hungary's, uh, Orban's Hungary. However, these ruling incumbent elites who want to concentrate power have a remarkably common playbook when it comes to the rule of law and the justice system, when it comes to uh, restricting non-governmental organizations and trying to co-opt them. 
this fight against corruption as a way to actually deflect attention from massive corruption, and of course the nationalism, this other, this otherness, you know, we as a nation. Um, you know, the struggle for the nation is used both to justify the concentration of power and to deflect attention from the concentration, especially of economic power. So Urban is the most accomplished, and one of the things that we see, and of course, I should add, this is what is happening in Turkey, this is what's happening in Russia, this is what's happening in the United States, especially on the state level. Um, but unfortunately, I see it also now happening in Poland and the Czech Republic and potentially in, uh, again in the Balkans. Now, Orban is the most accomplished, and here the EU is amazing, right? Because it's with the help of EU funds that these incumbent ruling elites are able to concentrate and consolidate their power. Not at all to blame the EU for the wonderful funding for infrastructure projects, but we see that, I mean, the cynicism, right, of lashing out against the EU while at the same time those ones being instrumental in the consolidation of power. We see that again also right now in the Czech Republic. Now, one of the questions which I'm often asked is, what about the Czech Republic? And here we have, unfortunately, uh, the Anna party of Andrei Babish. And he is now set to win the October elections until, unless something really unexpected happens. This is a party which is created by a, an oligarch. Essentially, one of the two or three most corrupt people in the region, I would say, or in the Czech Republic for sure, founds a party and is elected by the Czechs on an anti-corruption platform. I mean, the irony of this is sickening. And once in power, he does all kinds of things to benefit not the little people, but to benefit his own business interests. So it, it, it's just stunning, and yet his popularity continues to grow. And I'm going to come back to this problem of communication. Now, Babish is a little bit different than Hungary or Poland in the sense that he doesn't so much talk about defending the nation, as he talks about the benefits of concentrating power in order to create this kind of business state that is economically efficient. But I will write down the marker that in the last few months we see a real increase in racism in, in, in the way that he campaigns as well, unfortunately, as other Czech parties. So this racism always has been against the Roma, now against the refugees that don't exist, right? It's like anti-Semitism without the Jews. We have incredible Islamophobia without a single, really, refugee. And many people have been likening him to Trump, but since today we have an exciting day in world politics, including the testimony of James Comey, I will say that Babish is much more savvy than Trump in the sense that he essentially has the Czech police and secret services in the palm of his hand. He has managed over the last 20 years to hire many, many high-profile secret service and police officers, both from the communist era and from the post-communist era. And that means two things, that he has access to all kinds of information, that he has friends, contacts directly in the secret services the, and the judiciary and the police and the prosecutor's offices, and also that he has an incredible amount of material that he can use potentially to blackmail um, other politicians. And we've seen that play out on the front pages of the media that he now controls. So when other politicians cross him, it shows up on the front page. Uh, I want to say one word about North Carolina, where I work and live which is it's part of the same common playbook. We have a Republican supermajority in the legislature, and when we elected a Democratic government governor in November, the Republicans convened a special session to help the hurricane victims. How many of you heard about this? North Carolina, we are fighting. Uh, 15 minutes after the start of the special session, they started stripping the powers of the governor's office. So once they lost it, they basically took away his powers, like the night of the long nights, you know? It was, went on and on and on. So I want to end with two points. First, 
the supply versus demand of this populism and nationalism. So among many of my academic um, colleagues, we see a lot of scholarship focused on the demand for these kinds of positions. And what that means is that there are many opinion polls that show that 94% of Czechs don't want a single refugee, that whatever. And these opinion polls are a wonderful source of data. It's a great way to get your article written and published, and it's important to write about what people, what citizens think. But the problem with that is that it's not that citizens think these things and then politicians come along to, to represent them. We all know in this room that that is not how it works. What actually happens is that elites lead, elites create, party leaders lead voters to certain positions, right? And one of the things that we can all do is to stop using the passive voice and to start using the active voice. You know, this party had, you know, pushed this position in the campaign and to some extent changed public opinion. A great example for a positive is Vucic's Serbia. When Vucic decided that he was going to be EU compatible, he hired an opinion poll company to track his voters, the Progressive Party voters. Every two weeks, they did a poll for a while, and then every month, and he, in that poll, you can see how his voters start being more pro-EU and care less about Kosovo. And he was trying to push them in that direction. And it works both ways. Um, my other point is about, closing points, is about the role of other elites and the role of the status of politics. So I've worked in Czech politics enough to know that one of the problems with the concentration of power by these incumbent ruling elites is that we tend in the region to have fractured and incompetent oppositions. And I don't know why. I mean, if you look at Serbia, for example, this opposition is hopeless. I mean, of course, there are wonderful individual people in the opposition. But if Vucic does turn towards full-blown authoritarianism in the next couple of years, which I still don't think he will, what, It'll be in part because of the lack of a cons coherent opposition. In the Czech Republic, Babes is surging in part because the opposition can't organize itself. And there are, the reason, I, I don't know the reason exactly, there are a lot of personal animosities in these small groups of elites, but I think part of it is that people like to be the head of something, and working in party politics is hard. So if you get all your like-minded Prague elites who, who, see, who fear the rise of Babes, who understand what this means, that doesn't mean they can work together in a political party. And the other worrying thing is about how joining parties and working in politics is perceived in the region. We see more and more that young people especially want to have nothing to do with politics because if you say, I want to join a political party and be a politician, it's as if you're saying, I want to be a criminal. That's how a lot of my students in Belgrade and Prague and elsewhere explain it. And this has to be changed. And one of the most important things, I think, is for elites to lead the way and work with parties, in parties, because I am convinced that at the end, political parties are the most important source of political change. That's not saying that civil society isn't important and academia is important, but at the end of the day, it's like the protests in Bosnia. They went nowhere because the protesters said we want to have nothing to do with political parties. Okay, and finally, communication. How do we change the minds of voters? I hope I'm going to learn about that today <laughs> because it is so frustrating to see the, the difficulty in communication, and I'll just say, for example, the European Union. It's so easy for politicians to blame everything that goes wrong on the EU at the national level. And it is so difficult for the EU itself, for civil society groups, for center parties who want to talk about the benefits of European integration, to overcome that. We have this, you know, blame everything bad on the EU and take credit for everything good at the national level. And that's just one example of, you know, how the control of the media and so forth makes it really difficult to change how people vote and how people think. Okay.